the message that simply being good-hearted is enough to be a hero is one that a lot of action adventure shows have propagated. And I don't think it's a coincidence that these shows have almost always had a cis dude protagonist serving as this moral exemplar. But what is heart without responsibility? When a show tells us that a character is a hero because he's pure-hearted, it's also telling us that nothing else about him can be considered a flaw. Since these stories are flat out unwilling to acknowledge that any character flaws are a problem, they don't bother to push the pure-hearted heroes to be better or to even struggle except on the battlefield. This is how we end up with a hero with no growth over a 38-year run. Like, say, I don't know, Son Goku from Dragon Ball. Some of us, when we fail to do anything about our flaws, don't get the benefit of being considered pure of heart. I think being raised with this image of heroism in the media I consumed really messed me up. It impacted both the behavior I thought was acceptable for myself, as well as what kinds of treatment I tolerated from others. The idea that a person's goodness can exist independent of their actions, or that certain character flaws that cause inconvenience and harm for others are actually a person's strength, this is gender socialization, or terrible propaganda that harms everyone exposed to it. Goku gets away with being immature, self-absorbed, emotionally walled off, unaccountable, and flaky. For him, and heroes like him, purity of heart means that Creators use magic artifacts to teach kids that none of these are a problem for a hero. It's not that there's nothing to love about Goku as a hero. His dedication to his craft and hard work are certainly inspiring. But what about maturity? Reflecting on his need to grow as a person, not just as a fighter. A willingness to be emotionally vulnerable and to take accountability for his failings. What about being dependable for the people he cares about in his home? For a long time, I thought that I might be wrong to look for these values to be represented in action media aimed at young boys. But now, there's a relatively new show that almost seems to directly respond to our complaints about Goku. And it's called Amphibia. Our hero is Anne Boon Choi. And along her hero's journey, we get to see her hard-won growth in maturity, self-reflection, vulnerability, accountability, and dependability. Now, it might seem like a strange choice to compare these two series, but I actually think they share quite a lot in common. Both stories are comedy adventures featuring a fish-out-of-water teenage protagonist stuck on or in another world, referred to at various points as aliens. The scenes where each protagonist meets their guide to this world even share some neat visual similarities. This is Son Goku. He is an alien called a Saiyan that got dropped on Earth as a baby. He's raised by his adoptive grandpa, Son Gohan, prior to the series, then meets a girl named Bulma. She convinces him to join her in searching for the seven Dragon Balls, which, when collected, summon a dragon who can grant any wish. Kind of. Wacky adventures ensue. This is Anne Boon Choi, a human that got transported into a world of talking amphibians called Amphibia at age 13. She's taken in by the frog Hopadiah Planter, or Hop Hop, who becomes her adoptive grandpa, after meeting and befriending his grandson, Sprig Planter. She convinces the Planter family to help her find a way home, and wacky adventures ensue. Anne and Goku are both really lovable protagonists, charming kids with plucky attitudes and all that. But they're also both pretty similarly flawed, with a lot to learn. And by examining the differences in how each series treats their protagonist's flaws, we can learn to engage more critically with media in this genre, specifically how to identify heroes that are healthier role models for everyone. Because ultimately, stories about heroism are important. They have the power to influence how people think about right and wrong. And I think that this particular genre does have the ability to do what tales of heroism are supposed to do, inspire us to face our faults and strive to become better versions of ourselves. I want a shonen protagonist whose arc affirms the importance of character growth and shows that living up to our ideals isn't trivial, that it's a struggle, but one that's ultimately worth it. I'm Ms. Ayn Roselight, and I'm a trans femme with some feelings about gender and cartoons. So, uh, let's get into it. Oh, also, spoilers for all of Amphibia and various amounts of Dragon Ball content ahead. Part 1A, what is that? That doesn't really make any sense. There we go. That's a lot better. A common rhythm that early Dragon Ball finds itself in is Goku runs into an enemy or dangerous situation, often not recognizing the danger. Someone either tells him not to get involved or assumes that he'll get killed. Goku confronts it anyway. 
Goku wins because he is Goku and the rules don't apply to him. Like, for example, there's this bit where Goku is searching for the Dragon Balls and he butts heads with the Red Ribbon Army, which is apparently the largest terrorist group on the planet. Goku has no idea who these people are, so he doesn't really recognize how dangerous they are. Because Goku wants the Dragon Balls, he fights them anyways, despite other people telling him that they're really dangerous and he could get killed if he charges in head first. Goku does anyways because he is Goku, and despite almost dying on multiple occasions and another innocent person getting killed, it ultimately works out okay due to some combination of Goku's inherent abilities and deus ex machina's. Like, he gets saved by Frankenstein's monster at one point? It's wild. In a way, Goku's immaturity is kind of treated as a strength rather than a flaw. He doesn't know better than to charge full steam ahead and ends up succeeding despite others' expectations of him. And I want to be clear, for the kind of story that early Dragon Ball is, I think this actually can be really fun. But when I said in the intro that Goku had flaws and things to learn, that's my opinion. Often, I'm pretty sure that Dragon Ball doesn't really agree with me on that. Sure, Goku has things to learn as a fighter, new techniques and power-ups to achieve, but his development as a person has been fairly arrested for the past 38 years. I think this is a result of the Dragon Ball universe kind of being allergic to consequences, to put it mildly. From the Dragon Balls, to Senzu Beans, to the Super Dragon Balls, the series is full of magical artifacts that serve as increasingly powerful undo buttons on any negative outcomes of the character's actions. Meanwhile, Anne kind of gets put through the ringer for similar behavior in her series. In episode 2A of Amphibia, Anne needs to get a branch from something called the Doom Tree to... Well, we'll get to the why later. The point is, she's told it's way too dangerous, and there's no way she'll get that branch. She goes for it anyways because, hey, it's just some tree, right? Just like Goku, she doesn't really get how this world works yet, but she assumes that she'll be fine anyways, jumps in, and, oh, hey, how's it going, Anne? Having fun? Oh, you're, you're fighting for your life? Cool, I'm sure y'all have this under control. Anne and company eventually drive off the giant tree-slash-bug monster, but have to forfeit the branch they got to cover the damages of the fight. Oh, hey, consequences. Those are new. We haven't seen a lot of those in this video so far. Whether it's nearly getting eaten by a giant snake, actually getting eaten by a carnivorous tomato plant, or needing to fend off a murderous moth that she brought home as a pet caterpillar, basically each of these times Anne assumes that she knows better and everything will be fine, she's wrong. Things aren't fine. And then she has to deal with it. And as this goes on, something amazing happens. Anne changes. She gradually starts assuming less and less. She starts admitting when she's made mistakes instead of hiding it. She starts working to fix the problems she's caused. She starts taking the time to actually learn about the world she's in and matures. Like, yeah, we're watching a bunch of sitcom humor, but that sitcom humor is being structured in such a way that it pushes our main character to grow and learn. And it all stems from her actually experiencing consequences. In fact, there's an episode in Season 1A of Amphibia that we can use to directly compare the extent to which Anne and Goku face consequences for their character flaws, and that's girl time. When I started watching this episode for the first time, I thought that I was going to hate it. You see, there's another planter family member that I haven't talked about a whole lot, despite her being present in some of the scenes I've shown. Polly Planter is the youngest in the family, and she's pretty cool. She's unrepentantly interested in weapons and fighting, and she's got a pretty consistent come-at-me-bro energy. At the beginning of this episode, Sprig and Hot Pop are competing to see who can spit the farthest. Anne is visibly disgusted and becomes horrified when Polly proceeds to join in and spit the furthest out of all of them. Anne is convinced that Polly is gross because she's been hanging around, quote, the boys too much. So her solution is to grab Hot Pop's wallet and drag Polly along for some girl time. Yeah. One giant pile of gender essentialism here, and I was pretty on edge. Throughout the episode, it's clear that Polly's not having fun at all, and Anne is frustrated with her for failing to act girly enough. This escalates until eventually this happens. <gasps> well, excuse me for trying to make you less of a disgusting little slob. <gasps> After this, some stuff from earlier in the episode catches up with them. 
Turns out the IOUs that Anne's been handing out from Hot Pop's wallet are worthless. So Polly has to break the town spinning record in order to repay their debts. Polly gets three chances to break the record, and she fails at the first two because, well, she's feeling shame about herself after Anne's outburst. Anne realizes that she messed up and apologizes. Polly, I'm the gross one. I tried to change someone that's perfect the way they are. As a creator, it can be tempting to soften the problematic ideas or biases of a character that you deeply relate to. But Anne dealing with the fact that her ideas around gender, romance, friendship, and respect are actually kind of toxic and need to change make her such a compelling character to follow throughout these first few episodes. And it's core to her success as a hero. Dragon Ball never explores this with its protagonist, but in the series' defense, I suppose they really couldn't. I mean, for them to be able to explore Goku grappling with issues like in girl time, he'd have to have been written to have sexist or misogynistic beliefs. And it's clear from the show that he never thinks about gender that way. Oops. Well, that's awkward. I, I mean, listen, having a protagonist with a flat character arc is fine. Having a character who has serious flaws and never outgrows them is a thing that can work. When Dragon Ball sticks closer to its roots as a gag manga, and Goku acts as a force of nature that throws the world around him into disarray, his nature as an unchanging, flat character really sells the comedy. But when the character is also portrayed by the story to be one of the goodest boys to ever exist, then stuff like this is really off-putting. It makes me think that maybe, just maybe, you don't think that attitudes like this are actually bad. Hmm. Look. At their core, stories about heroes are morality tales. They're supposed to serve as, in some way, guides as to how to do better. And that's why, although flat characters can work in general, they can't work as heroes. It's like you're giving us a map and you've marked all the locations of where heroism is, but you've given us no guide on how to get there or what pitfalls to avoid. And when your own personal biases start seeping in, some of those locations end up just plain being wrong. So maybe at this point you're thinking, okay, Mazine, I get it. Gender stereotypes are bad. Not acknowledging character flaws is bad. And maybe you're even thinking, right, those things are bad because they hurt people. But I want to take it one level deeper. Not only can mistakes and flaws hurt people, but as a result, they hurt our relationships with those people. Groundbreaking take, I know. And to go a level even deeper, without those positive relationships, we're likely to not only stop growing better, but to stagnate or spiral into the worst version of ourselves. That phrase is foreshadowing. It's going to pay off in the end. Trust me. And I think Amphibia absolutely nails this. It's not about Anne just experiencing consequences in the abstract. It's about how Anne's actions have consequences, positive and negative, for her relationships. But in order to understand how the show accomplishes this, we have to go over the setup of season one's plot in a little bit more detail. So Anne gets isekai'd to Amphibia after opening this music box, along with her best friends Marcy Wu and Sasha Waybright. Episode one starts with the planters going to town and a frog named Wally ranting about a monster he ran into in the woods. That monster is Anne. All of those isekai where a cis dude gets sent to another world that's basically just like ours and everyone's human-ish, except all the femcast is inexplicably attracted to him, those have nothing on this, where no one's seen a human being and they all think we're horrendous nightmare demons. This sets up Anne's arc for the season really well. You see, Anne wants to get back home, right? That's the plot. But Wartwood is situated in Frog Valley, and leaving the valley is impossible until the way out unthaws in about three months. Anne is stuck here, basically unable to make much progress on the main plot for a whole season, which is a bold writing decision. I wouldn't blame you for thinking that spending a whole season like this wouldn't really work, but it does, because what if the real way home was the friends we made along the way? The whole Anne is a monster thing doesn't go away after the first episode, which makes living in Wartwood pretty difficult for Anne. Sprig warms up to her pretty immediately, and Hop Hop is willing to take care of her, but the rest of the town totally ostracizes her. So winning over the town of Wartwood increasingly becomes one of Anne's goals. The thing is, Anne is pretty selfish in the beginning of season one. She pressures Sprig into going to the lake with her, even though Hop Hop told them not to. Even when it's clear that there's probably a good reason to not go swimming in the lake, and that Sprig is really uncomfortable, Anne keeps pushing. 
Look, if a friend likes a pencil case, you get it for them. If your friend likes your new shoes, you give them to her. And if a friend wants you to steal a crazy music box from a thrift store, even if you really don't want to, you do it, okay? Because if you don't, they might not want to be your friend anymore. Oof, where'd you pick that mentality up from, Anne? Oh, ominous. After this all goes belly up, Anne apologizes to Sprig, and this forms the beginning of Anne's first healthy friendship. She still pretends that they never left the house when Hop Pop asks, but then in the next episode, you know, the one with the doom tree that I mentioned before, in that episode, Anne breaks Hop Pop's cane, a prized family heirloom, and is trying to get a branch from the doom tree to replace it. She fails and has to come clean to Hop Pop. After trying to avoid them, she's ready to accept the consequences of her mistake. In the progression of these early episodes, we see Anne increasingly taking ownership over the impact of her actions instead of just hiding from them. With each mistake she makes, she reacts by moving further away from selfishness, increasingly considering the wants and needs of others, and more readily accepting consequences for her actions. And by repairing the harm she's caused in these instances, she builds a deeper relationship with the planters, one that she's willing to protect. Anne actually gives up a chance at fame and adoration when she's told that she'd have to abandon the planters to maintain it, and chooses them over the social acceptance that she's been craving since she got to Wartwood. People call this filler? All of this culminates in the season's halfway point, toad tax. You see, while the frogs of Wartwood have started to accept Anne, they still don't respect her. They still make fun of her appearance and are just generally pretty awful to her. When some toads roll into town to collect taxes from people who supposedly haven't paid, they offer Anne the opportunity to work with them. While the frogs of Wartwood all have to labor to survive as farmers, craftspeople, and service industry workers, the toads of Toad Tower have a job that's kind of hard to explain. You see, they go around wearing these badges, stealing property, demanding respect through the threat of violence, enforcing laws that serve to benefit those in power and maintain the existing caste system. They're cops, okay? The toads are cops. Anne jumps at the chance to join them, thinking it'll finally earn her the respect she deserves. The planters aren't so sure. And when I said earn the town's respect, I didn't mean join a gang. Do y'all see why I like this show so much? Anyways, as Anne sees the toads stealing stuff from the frogs, she feels increasingly uncomfortable with the job she's taken on. Trying to minimize the damage, she takes opportunity to salvage as much of the town people's stuff for them as she can. Ultimately, they arrive at the planter farm, and Anne knows that Hop Hop paid his taxes. When the toads go to ransack the farm anyways, Anne stands up to them, on behalf of her family and the whole town. All I wanted was this town's respect. But just because these people treated me crummy doesn't mean I'm gonna do the same to them. I'm done with this. I don't care if they've broken the law. You can't treat people like this! When Anne goes on to fight the Toad single-handedly, I'm reminded of Goku fighting the Red Ribbon Army mostly on his own. Except instead of traveling around the world and decimating entire armies, Anne is defending one place, Wartwood, and gets, well... <laughs> Jesus. And there are no magic beans to heal that instantly in Amphibia. No magic artifacts to grant a wish to make everything better. Anne is in a world without those kinds of get out of consequences free buttons. And so her showing integrity and fighting for what's right involves pain and sacrifice that the show makes particular note of. Even when doing the right thing, Anne has to live with the consequences. I want to point out that Anne finally hits this tipping point, finally stands up to the toads, when the planter farm is threatened, when her home is threatened. The idea that home is deeply important to Anne is reflected in her long-term goal of getting back to Earth, but it's also present in this season's arc of making Wartwood a place where Anne feels that she belongs. And that place, that sense of belonging, is something that she has achieved with the planters, and it gives her strength. It enables her to make the right choices. By the end of this episode, the town jumps in to defend her. Wartwood, not just the farm, but Wartwood, really becomes her home too. And it's because of the growth she experienced living with the planters. She was able to find a sense of home in another world. And building these deeper relationships by acknowledging the impact of her actions and learning from them, that's what leads to her being the kind of person who will do the right thing here. 
As for what leads to Goku being the kind of person who fights against injustice, well, uh, we'll get to it. It's a doozy. We'll get to it. So Anne's a new and better person now, right? She's clearly grown into a pure-hearted hero, even if she didn't start out that way, right? Well... I'm playing by PG-13 rules for this video, by the way. This is a kid's show I'm discussing, after all. I get one actual swear word, and I want to save it for when I really need it. In Chapter 3 of Dragon Ball, Goku protects the lost sea turtle and helps him get back to the ocean. As a reward for this act of kindness, Sea Turtle, no, seriously, that's his name, introduces Master Roshi, who in turn gifts Goku Kintoun. Kintoun is a flying cloud that only the pure of heart can ride upon, so of course Goku is the only one there who can ride it. Much later on, Goku is fighting an enemy called Devil Man in order to locate one of the Dragon Balls. Devil Man hits Goku with this beam that destroys anyone who has even a shred of evil in their heart. Any guesses on what happens to Goku? Yep, nothing, because Goku has no evil in his heart. Huh, guess misogyny is an evil. Go figure. Just in case you think I'm milking that example too much, let's talk about another flaw of Goku's, his selfishness. Oh, hey, that's familiar. Sure, he'll go out of his way to help people in need, often with no fear of any consequences because magic balls, magic beans, magic body. But he's more motivated by his desire to fight strong opponents than by concern for the fate of the world. Like when he and his friends finally defeat Vegeta, another Saiyan who at this point had killed several of their friends. His remaining friends are about to finish him off when Goku stops them, for the sole reason that it would be such a waste to not get to fight him again. And they just have to go, okay, I guess you did save the world, so I guess you can get what you want? Oh, but I'm sure he outgrows this. For all of his commitment to acknowledging his limitations as a fighter, Goku has much less self-awareness of his shortcomings as a person. Because why would he? He's already as good as he needs to be. The magic cloud and the funny devil guy's magic bean said so. What's worse, we eventually learn that Goku was actually a pretty awful child when Grandpa Gohan first found him. Goku would constantly attack the person who found him stranded and took him in. Did Gohan's unconditional love and care turn Goku from this little demon into the pure and good boy he is now? Nope. Turns out Goku fell down a ravine and hit his head really hard. That's it. I'm not joking. Goku Humpty Dumpty's his way into being pure of heart. Not only is being good something that requires no work, it's also apparently completely coincidental. And Amphibia thinks that's a bunch of frog spit. In Season 1b, we have more instances of Anne going out of her way to try and help the people of Wartwood, but she still falls back into selfishness sometimes. She still has room to grow, and she still has to work to become a better person. We get a wonderful encapsulation of this in the penultimate episode of the season, where Anne gets voted Frog of the Year by the citizens of Wartwood. After the party she throws in celebration ends in catastrophe, Anne has to team up with the mayor to save the citizens from her own party literally exploding. You were right about me, mayor. I am selfish. I got so obsessed with proving I deserve this, I ruined everything. I'm no frog of the year. Why did anyone even vote for me? Anne, we didn't vote for you because you're flawless. <laughs> far from it. We voted for you because of how far you've come. You've grown so much in your time here, and this town just wouldn't be the same without you. Yeah, yeah. That's why I voted for her. This summary of Anne's arc through season one is a major repudiation that Amphibia levels at the pure of heart trope. Being perfectly selfless and good is impossible, and believing that you are is actually detrimental to your ability to become better. More often than not, the very concept of pure-heartedness portrays immaturity as virtue, selfishness as an acceptable indulgence, and the existence of recognized personal flaws as disqualifiers to being the hero. But that's just not how life works. Growth is more important than perfection. An idea that Dragon Ball effortlessly grasps when it comes to diligence at one's craft, but seems to miss the boat on when it comes to the main character's, well, character. 
Now, some of you Dragon Ball fans might be going, well, wait, isn't consistency an important value for a hero? I mean, sure, Goku is sexist sometimes, and maybe he lets enemies go when he shouldn't. But he never backs down from fighting injustice. Is that something that Anne can say about herself? And to that I'd say, wait, there's still Dragon Ball fans watching this video? Wow, props to y'all. Um, thanks for sticking it out so far. But I have to admit that you're right. Whenever a threat to Goku's friends and family shows up, he never backs down and faces it head on. And there's no better example of this than when his long lost brother Raditz shows up in the very beginning of Dragon Ball Z. So for those who haven't seen it, Dragon Ball Z picks up after the end of the original Dragon Ball manga, with a time skip of a few years in between. We see Goku, who has a son now, and check in on a bunch of old friends. Then this guy Raditz shows up with a tail? Wait, but Goku and his son are the only people that we've seen with tails, so what's going on? We learn, after 194 chapters of the story, that Goku is actually an alien called a Saiyan that was sent to Earth as a baby to wipe out humanity. The Saiyans are conquerors and have carried out similar genocides on various planets across space. Raditz is also a Saiyan, and he's Goku's brother. He shows up and attacks Goku's best friend, Krillin, and tries to get Goku to carry out the genocide he was originally sent here to do. Raditz tries to justify the violence that he and the other Saiyans have been perpetrating, saying that after the destruction of their homeworld, it was the only way for them to survive. That doing this is the only way that they could ever hope to build a home again. And Goku shouldn't value the lives of these humans over the future of his own people. The thing is, we know Raditz is wrong because we've seen Goku build a home here on Earth by forging connections with others and fighting against injustice. For all my qualms with portraying him as morally perfect, Goku did save the Earth and has helped a lot of people throughout his various escapades. Earth is his home, and I think this is one of the few parts of Dragon Ball Z, or Dragon Ball Original or Super for that matter, that really sells us on that idea. So Goku tells Raditz that he is an Earthling and will fight to defend the planet from him, his own brother. This, I'd argue, is one of Goku's best moments turning against the only link he has to where he came from in order to protect the planet and people he's come to love. And this is a great way to test the heroism of your main character. Does Anne ever get tested in this way? They're just slimy little frogs, Anne. They don't matter! Oh, ominous. So in the Amphibia Season 1 finale, Anne's enjoying the party, reveling in the Frog of the Year celebration after getting it back on track. So then Sasha shows up to murder Hop Pop. I mean, okay, she shows up to reunite with Anne and try to find a way home for them. But the way she goes about that is trying to murder Hop Pop. The Toads are trying to execute him because he stood up to the tax collectors in Toad Tax, which inspired frog rebellions against the Toads across the valley. Sasha struck a deal with the Toad Captain, Grime. She helps them kill Hop Pop, and they help her find her friends and get home. Anne obviously doesn't want this to happen, so she tries to help the frogs escape Toad Tower. When Sasha catches them, it leads to this confrontation. Enough! Anne, what are you doing? Are you really gonna risk your life for these talking frogs? We don't even belong here. Don't you want to get back home? See your family? Yeah, but then put your sword down now. End of discussion. Okay, and this is just like Toad Tax. You just need to stand up to the... Wait, wait, why are you putting your sword down? What's going on? Even Sprig's confused. So now the five Dragon Ball fans who are still watching this video might be saying, See? All that growth doesn't matter if Anne crumbles when she's actually tested. Goku was tested and he rose to the occasion. What's the deal? But I'd say Anne is being tested here in a way that Goku never really has been. You see, Anne and Sasha have been friends since kindergarten. Anne has a really deep emotional bond with Sasha, but at the same time, Sasha's been manipulating Anne and pushing her around her whole life. And Anne not being able to push back against it and stand up for herself, well, that's how they got here in the first place. Come on, let's keep this party train rolling. Choo choo. Sorry, dude, you don't understand. I really gotta go. Oh, I understand, Anne. You're a good little girl who's got to go home to her mommy and daddy. Come on, hang out with your friends that love you. Sasha, I really like to, but... Anne, this isn't cute anymore. 
We are meeting up with Marcy right now. End of discussion. I guess it's okay if I'm a little late. Sasha pushed Anne to be immature and selfish, to turn her back on her home. It's a relationship that, at the time, was bringing out the worst in her. And now, after building relationships that bring out the best in her, she's being tested. Once again, pushed to turn her back on her home. They're like poetry. They rhyme. Remember that thing I said in Season 1A about good heroes being like maps? Well, if you ask your map, how do I do the right thing in the face of a friend who's been manipulating me for years, and the only answers it gives are, you never should have been friends with that person in the first place, uh, just do the right thing, or maybe try falling down a ravine, then that's not a good map. Sure, Goku fights against injustice, but when Raditz shows up, I don't think anyone went, oh yeah, Goku might betray the people he spent years growing to love and commit genocide because his long-lost brother he never met before told him to. But Amphibia really lingers on this tension. For a second, for a brief second, the show convinces you that Anne might let Hop Pop die. Anne was ready to take on the whole Toad army for Hop Pop, but falters against Sasha. That's how deep Sasha's manipulation over Anne goes. How do you overcome something like that? For someone who's Anne's best friend, you sure don't know her very well. She's brave, she's smart, and most of all, she's not going to be pushed around by a bully like you! Anne maturing in the face of consequences and committing to being better has allowed her to build the kind of relationships that encourage her growth. And when the chips are down, it's those relationships that help you be the best version of yourself. That encourage the self-love you need to stand up to people like Sasha. This is it! This is the map! And similar to Goku, Anne does stand up to Sasha and do the right thing. But Amphibia really gets that it's not just about the destination. It's about the journey. When Goku fights Raditz alongside Piccolo, he's another alien, it's, it's a whole thing, the question is simply whether or not they're strong enough to defeat him. Goku ends up sacrificing himself so Piccolo can kill them both. This sets Goku up for an arc where he trains in the afterlife for a while before being resurrected, and his death amounts to nothing more than another trip to train with yet another incredible master. Since it happens in the beginning of Z, it makes sense to use this encounter this way show that Goku needs to put in serious work to face this new level of threat and expand the world that the new series will explore. But by putting a similar confrontation at the end of a season, while having built up the dynamic between Anne and Sasha via their interactions with other characters all season, and hinging the outcome on all of the growth Anne experienced actually sticking, Amphibia gives us something both incredible and absolutely devastating. Best friends, just barely teenagers, are swinging swords at each other. Even if they both survive, what will they be after this? We want Anne to win. We're glad that she's finally confronting Sasha. But we're also sad that it ever had to get to this point. At least, that's how I felt. Anne eventually triumphs, but draws blood in the process. I mean, it's justified. Sasha was trying to kill Hop Hop and Sprig. But, wow, things are never going to be the same between them. They're going to need some serious therapy and time to work all of this out. And oh my god, the tower is exploding. Anne grabs Sasha, trying to save her from falling, but even with the planters helping, they can't pull Sasha back up, and the tower is continuing to crumble. I love the way Sasha's eyes dart back and forth and then close. This is her realizing that she's probably not surviving this, accepting her fate and it's absolutely brutal. Sasha lets go and Anne watches one of her best friends since kindergarten fall to her death. Okay, she gets saved at the last second, but the emotional fallout of this fight is still massive. Sure, they're both alive, but Anne is... um... not okay. Goku's good deeds, even just his basic decency, are often enough to net him all kinds of supernatural gifts and opportunities for personal advancement. This idea that if you clear some, let's be honest, pretty low bar for goodness, that you'll always be rewarded for it is based on a lot of privilege. Anne didn't get a magic cloud for doing the right thing. She didn't get invited to train with gods. Anne won, but she had to fight her best friend and that friendship is now in tatters. It hurts. 
but it was still the right thing to do. Doing good, bettering yourself, is hard. And a lot of the time you get kicked in the teeth for it. And you should do it anyway. It's not the default state. It's not a coincidence. It's a constant struggle. But there is good news. You don't have to struggle alone. One of the things I really enjoy about early Dragon Ball is Goku's relationship with Grandpa Gohan. In Chapter 1, Goku and Bulma meet because she's been looking for the Dragon Balls, and Goku has the Four Star Ball. However, Goku isn't willing to part with it because it's a memento from his late grandpa. This is really sweet. It's a touching detail that makes the kid fairly endearing from the jump. Just ignore the bit where this only happened because of blunt force head trauma. Something I haven't mentioned about the Dragon Balls is that once they're used, they scatter and become dormant for a year. So this has resulted in Goku and friends needing to recollect the Dragon Balls at various points throughout the series. However, Goku rarely starts searching for all the Dragon Balls after they reactivate, because he usually doesn't have a wish that he wants granted. He only looks for the Four Star because it's precious to him. Sure, he enjoys the adventure, but he's also trying to keep a hold of something from the only family that raised and loved him. There's this bit at the end of the Red Ribbon Army Saga, where Goku fights a masked fighter that really seems to know a lot about him. After winning, Goku learns that it was his grandpa Gohan, back from the dead on a day pass to fight him and check up on him. This is a really heartwarming scene, and I think this might be the first time we've ever seen Goku cry. He asks if Gohan can live with him again, and is disappointed when he has to go back to the afterlife so soon. This is the person who set Goku on the path that made him who he is, from training him and raising him to leaving him the Four Star. When Goku later gives the Four Star Dragon Ball to his first son, who he named after his grandpa, it's a loving passing of the torch and honoring of the man who did so much for him. How did Grandpa Gohan die, by the way? Well, it turns out that Saiyans turn into giant apes whenever they look at a full moon and go on a rampage. Gohan learned this and told Goku to never look at a full moon. When he accidentally does look at a full moon, he goes on a rampage and unknowingly kills his own grandpa. A bunch of characters realize this before Goku does, and go to great pains to make sure that he never finds out. Because that would be emotionally devastating, right? To learn that you are responsible for the death of someone that you love so deeply? If Goku ever finds out, I bet he'll need a lot of time to process that, and he's mildly upset about it for one scene when he finds out, and then never mentions it again. Can't have our action hero showing too much emotional vulnerability, right? Okay, there is one other point in Dragon Ball where Goku shows how the weight of loss affects him, and that's with Krillin. Krillin is Goku's best friend, and after a martial arts tournament, he gets murdered. This was Goku's best friend, and now he's dead. Don't worry, he gets better. We have Dragon Balls. Goku is furious and heartbroken. He rushes off to avenge his friend, only to be swiftly defeated before he can get his revenge. On his second attempt, he's able to kill the demon that killed Krillin. But once Goku gets his revenge, he's actually not super broken up about Krillin's death. After all, they can bring Krillin back with the Dragon Balls. Something important to note, though, is that the Dragon Balls can't grant the same wish twice. So people can only be revived from the dead once. If Krillin were to die again, Goku might have to face some serious feelings of grief. So how do Anne and Amphibia... Anne and Amphibia... That's a tongue twister. Hold on. Let's rewrite the script. How does the frog show with the good hero talk about vulnerability? Season 2A has Anne finally starting her journey out of the valley with the planters, headed towards the amphibian capital of Newtopia in hopes of finding a way back to Earth. Also, my producer Sasin wanted me to stop and explain that the city's called that because newts live there. Like, Newtopia. Sasin said that the name was too good, so kudos to the Amphibia team on that one. Before they head out, though, Anne realizes how much the planters are risking just to help her get home. As a result, she decides to take fortifying the house and the farm against any threats while they're away into her own hands. When her attempts result in a giant vegetable monster destroying the house, we get this scene. Everything I work so hard to protect. Oh, you just made a big mistake, buddy. <laughs> a 
Okay, so her eyes flashed blue and she got a power boost. We'll get to talking about that at some point. But to me, what this scene sets up for the season is Anne dealing with loss and grief. Her reaction to the house's destruction isn't just rage. She's expressing pain at losing something that clearly meant so much to her that she was willing to go to such lengths to protect it. This is a clear continuation from the season one finale. The concept of home has been fundamental to Anne's character arc so far. And in season two, that concept of home helps Anne open her heart more. And we can see this in her reunion with Marcy. Throughout season one, we rarely saw Anne express much worry about Sasha or Marcy. But now, outside Newtopia, Anne confesses that she's worried that something bad might have happened to Marcy. After seeing Sasha nearly fall to her death, Anne has realized that things could get really bad here. And this is the first time we've seen her be open about those fears. When she finally reunites with Marcy outside the Newtopia gates, it's such a touching moment, and the relief that Marcy's okay is apparent in Anne's reaction. Later in the episode, after being incredibly protective of Marcy, Anne reveals just how much this has been affecting her. Uh, why won't you just let me go? Because I just got you back, okay? It's interesting because, at least when I watched season one, I never really thought of Anne as particularly closed off emotionally. But when it comes to the deep stuff, the reality of what it meant to be stuck in such a dangerous world away from her parents, where her friends could be in danger? Well, it turns out there's a lot that Anne wasn't talking about. In the following episode, this growing vulnerability is presented as Anne's strength. Anne is feeling jealous because Marcy's always done better in school, been better at solving puzzles and that kind of thing. And that's made Anne feel like she wasn't smart enough in comparison. When the King of Amphibia sends Marcy a message hidden in a series of puzzles, Anne tries to solve them first to prove to herself that she's smart. She fails the first two puzzles, with Marcy being the one to solve them, but she makes some new friends along the way. However, this isn't just the stereotypical protagonist with a heart of gold does a helpful act for a stranger situation. In each encounter, Anne makes a connection by opening up to the citizens she encounters. Whether it's talking about her cat back home, asking for help with the puzzle, being willing to hear about someone's sons and their interpersonal drama, or even admitting to her insecurities about her intelligence, Anne's openness and vulnerability is what enables her to forge relationships so naturally. Yes, she does help these people out, but that's only the beginning of her bond with them, not the entirety of it. In one of the following episodes, Hopping Mall, Anne is trying to find a souvenir for her mom after going missing in another dimension for several months. Anne puts a lot of thought into finding the perfect gift for her mom, who likes antiques, butterflies, and drinking tea. So when the opportunity to win an antique butterfly teapot presents itself, Anne jumps on it. In order to win it, she has to beat this newt mother-daughter pair in a shopping cart derby brawl thing. Anne and Sprig come out on top on account of the newt's tail injury, but it's revealed that the prize teapot was actually made by that newt's mother. It was the last thing she ever made. Anne opens up, saying that she was going to give the teapot to her mom, but she thinks that she would want the newt to have it instead. In response to Anne's generosity, the newt's daughter gives her a handmade butterfly brooch to give to her mom. That night, we get this conversation between Anne and Sprig. It's so pretty. I'm sure your mom's gonna love it. Mm. Yeah. What's she like? My mom? Um, kind. In her own way. But strict, too. She wanted me to study more. Thought I goofed off too much. We didn't always see eye to eye. She annoyed me sometimes, too. Like, in the kitchen, she'd always sing these goofy Thai love songs. And man, was her singing bad. Woof. That woman was beyond tone deaf. You know, the funny thing is, right now, I would give anything just to hear her singing. Whoa. Sorry. Sorry, I just, uh... Need a moment. I still cry every time I watch that scene. Sprig, along with the audience, gets this real look at how being stuck in amphibia without her parents has affected Anne emotionally. And it makes perfect sense that we're getting this reveal now, as opposed to in season one. One of Anne's best friends manipulated her constantly. Anne, consciously or not, probably understood that showing vulnerability to someone like Sasha was just giving her more tools to control her with. But she's shown that she can fight back against Sasha now, and has even encouraged Marcy to take more agency. Back home, Sasha always decided the plan. <laughs> yeah, 
Maybe it's time we started making our own decisions, huh? The last decision Anne let Sasha make ended up separating her from her parents. That probably has a lot to do with how confronting Sasha has enabled Anne to start processing and sharing these feelings. Her heart may not be pure, whatever that means, but it is open. Anne truly, deeply cares. At the end of this half of the season, we get the reveal from the King of Amphibia, King Andreas, that the three gems in the music box need to be recharged at three different temples in Amphibia before it can be used to return them home. Each gem has a different color and a different word written underneath it. Marcy's eyes glowed green in episode 6, and that certainly fits her color scheme, so that one must be hers. Meanwhile, Anne's eyes glowed blue back in the first episodes of both season 1 and 2. If we look at the word written underneath the blue gem and use the cipher to translate from amphibian script to English, we get the word heart. I mean, I suppose you could have just looked at the little picture of a heart, but that's less fun. Of course Anne's aspect is heart. She has this incredible ability to forge connections with others, one that's built off of her decision to be vulnerable with them. She's not perfect at it. To be clear, in this very episode, she tries to use a trip to the aquarium to distract herself from dealing with the prospect of separating from the planters. But by the end, she accepts that trying to shut herself off, to avoid dealing with her feelings or sharing them with others, will only make things worse in the end. And now better understanding the importance of an open heart, She's finally prepared to do something that requires a lot of vulnerability. Season 2, Episode 17A, The Second Temple, is an absolute masterpiece. This episode is so fundamental to how Amphibia takes Dragon Ball's concepts of worthiness and evolves them into something truly magnificent that I just have to unrepentantly gush about it. The episode starts out with the team landing in the Amphibian Arctic, seeking the second temple to recharge the blue Calamity Gem. Marcy mentions that all the texts about this temple kept mentioning the word heart. Oh, I know where this is going. This is going to be Anne's temple. She'll face a supernatural worthiness test, the show will affirm how much she's grown, and we'll get some more celebration of Anne's strengths. Classic, pure-hearted, chosen one type stuff. A newt we met in season one, Valeriana, serves as our team's guide to the second temple. Throughout the journey, Anne goes out of her way to sacrifice her own comfort and safety for the sake of others, even for total strangers. Valeriana calls her impulsive, defensive, and keeps making jabs at her about how unworthy she is. But this is all pretty standard pure of heart test stuff. Make sure that the hero is actually being selfless and not just doing good deeds for external validation. However, we also get this scene. It's so fortunate that the music box fell into such average hands. How exactly did it come into your possession? Uh... You know, I don't remember how we got it. That's right. Anne stole the music box. It's something that she's never really had to answer for, because the only ones who know are Sasha and Marcy. Eventually, Valeriana and Anne's conflict escalates, resulting in the newt warping them to the top of this giant tower. It's so giant that it towers above the clouds. Valeriana uses this opportunity to take the music box from Anne, and uses her staff to keep it out of Anne's reach. Wait a second. Giant tower, old master with a staff who can maybe read minds, a game of keep away, and a test of worthiness? This is referencing Karin's tower, a place where Goku trained to get strong enough to defeat the rest of the Red Ribbon army. Goku's test of worthiness was to try and take this jug of water from Karin, the martial arts master who lives at the top of this tower. As usual, the contrast between the two scenes highlight how Amphibia uses encounters paralleling those in Dragon Ball to advance a significantly different narrative. When Goku meets Karin at the top of the tower, the martial arts master reads the boy's mind and judges his heart and intentions to be pure and selfless. Valeriana has spent the whole trip telling Anne she isn't worthy, and claims that even now Anne is only seeking the temple for her own interests. And she's not entirely wrong. The main reason Anne's doing this is to get back home. Also, remember the selfish things Anne did in season one? In the filler episodes? Valeriana remembers. Didn't you lie to the planters to get out of a day of work? How, how do you know that? Whoa! Didn't you drive the family snail even though you were told not to? Whoa! Okay, this is getting weird. What else do you know? I know that you snore. But I kept that one to yourself. <laughs> Didn't you steal Hoppadaya's wallet for a girl's day on the town? Uh, oh. 
Okay, that is definitely not how that happened. But you did steal the music box, did you not? I... I... I did steal it. So it is! You are a liar and a thief! You know what's interesting? When Goku is trying to get the water from Karin, he considers stealing it while the cat is napping. <laughs> cat napping. But anyways, at the last second, he decides that no, he's going to properly earn it by taking it from him while he's awake. Karin, who wasn't actually sleeping, even remarks internally on how refreshingly honest Goku is. So when Valeriana calls Anne out for stealing the music box, calling her a liar and a thief, it's such a stark juxtaposition that I have to believe it's intentional. Goku's encounter highlights his best characteristics, whereas Anne's forces her to face some of her worst decisions. We've all seen how much Anne has grown, but presumably so has Valeriana. And that's great, but growth on its own isn't even enough. Valeriana lunges for the box, overshoots, and Anne saves her from falling off the tower. Then we get what is honestly my favorite scene in the entire show. You were right. I did lie and steal. If that makes me unworthy, fine. Those bad choices were mine, and I'll own them. But making them taught me that it's always better to do the right thing. So that's what I did, regardless of how much I didn't want to. We have been waiting for someone like you for such a long time. You have sacrificed your warmth for your friends, your safety for a stranger in need. You even risked your life for an enemy. But empathy alone isn't enough for what is heart without responsibility. In the name of the temple, I declare you worthy. What an amazing response to the phenomenon I was describing in this video's introduction. Who cares if you have a good heart? What does that even mean? The convenient thing about claiming some kind of internal goodness is that it's completely unverifiable without magical intervention. Empathy and kindness are great, but that's not enough. Even doing good on its own isn't enough. There are times, for all of us, when our actions hurt the people we claim to care about. Even if we grow, even if we are really listening, learning, and committing to doing better, we still have to own the times when our own selfishness outweighed our commitment to integrity. The times when we decided that getting what we wanted was more important than doing what's right. We are responsible for all of our actions, even the ones that take place in the filler episodes of our lives. You can't just minimize it away, claim that it's not reflective of who you are, or expect a single apology and or act of kindness to repair the harm that you caused. Bob Chapek, take some fucking notes. When Anne takes responsibility for her actions, Valeriana says that her order has been waiting for such a long time for someone like her. And to me, it feels very meta. I might be completely off base here, but I really get the sense that this is a show made by a bunch of people who loved a lot of shonen, loved a lot of action cartoons that they grew up with, but felt similar frustrations when cis men protagonists were given a pass for their actions because they were, quote, so good hearted. And the idea of that being the case, that people working on the show were able to evolve aspects of the media they grew up with into something that embodied the values they'd been longing to see represented is truly inspiring. After she finally acknowledges stealing the music box, we get a scene where Anne says that she doesn't want to change her outfit too much because she's finally happy with who she sees in the mirror. Taking responsibility for one's actions can be scary, and it requires a lot of vulnerability, but it's also profoundly liberating. Anne started the series feeling lost without Sasha and Marcy, like she needed them to give her direction. That's a mindset rooted in a lot of self-loathing. And the thing about self-loathing is that it tends to ripple outwards, resulting in actions that harm others. But through owning the impact of her actions, Anne has really started to love herself. And that's what's enabled her to become a better version of herself. Because in actuality, believing that you're perfect is the opposite of self-love. It's rooted in the idea that needing to take accountability for something you've done makes you undeserving of love. And when that belief has taken root in your mind, it makes it really easy for you to get used in a fascist plot. Guessing that's probably not how y'all expected that sentence to end. But it's a point that Amphibia makes clear, and we can understand it by comparing Anne's accountability to that of another character, Marcy. 
So remember the king of Amphibia, Andreas? Turns out he's a fascist. Though maybe the whole king part made that obvious. He's been so excited about the trio recharging the box because he wants to use it to, quote, restore Amphibia to its former glory, invading and conquering other worlds. And honestly, this makes sense. He's the ruler of a society with a species-based caste system. He sent people to hunt down Grime, not for trying to kill Hop Pop, but for failing to kill Hop Pop. Of course he's a fascist. And not only that, he's an imperialist who's planning on invading and conquering Earth with the power of the music box. Accountability means admitting when we put our own desires over the greater good, something that Anne is able to do in the face of this revelation. She acknowledges that in her focus on getting home and her relationships with Marcy and Sasha, she totally ignored signs that would have alerted her to not enable the fascist king. And then... Stop! Andrew, this wasn't the plan. You said no one would get hurt. I would have said anything if it meant you deliver the box to me fully charged. Hate to break it to you, kiddo, but you've been duped. Okay, so reveal number two. Marcy was colluding with Andreas behind everyone's back. She didn't want to go home at all, and she was planning on dragging Anne and Sasha along with her on endless adventures in any world but the one they came from. Why? Well, it turns out that this isn't the first time Marcy planned something like this. Did it ever occur to you, Anne, Sasha, that one of you knew more than she was letting on? That one of you might have gotten you stranded in Amphibia on purpose. I did it for us. The day we left, your birthday, they told me my dad got a new job out of state. They're making me move away. They're going to tear us apart. Marcy. I, I found the box. I had no idea that it would actually work, but it did. And, and it sent us to a place where we'd never have to grow apart, where the three of us could be friends forever together. How could you? I've been missing my parents, my life. But look at how much fun we've had. Look at how much you've both grown. Look at Sprig, I gave you this. I gave you everything. I just didn't want to be alone. We can keep in mind the nuance that what Marcy has been pushed to admit bears a much larger social cost than anything Anne's admitted to. But this is not accountability. This is, I didn't do anything. If I did do something, it was an accident. If it wasn't an accident, then actually it was a good thing. And ultimately, all of these justifications and excuses give way to the truth that this was something Marcy did for herself, with little regard for how Anne or Sasha felt about it. The importance of maintaining integrity in the face of temptation is a moral that Dragon Ball actually does try to promote as well. Credit where credit's due. Dragon Ball does want to interrogate cis masculine ideals around power and integrity, and it does so through the Super Saiyan transformation. When Goku first turns into a Super Saiyan, it's during a fight against a villain named Frieza, a racist, genocidal emperor who's wiped out countless planets and conquered them. If you're interested in what happens in this arc of Dragon Ball Z and all the setup behind the Super Saiyan form, then I'd highly recommend both Cosmonaut Variety Hour's video on this arc as a whole as well as Overly Sarcastic Productions video on the prophecy of the Super Saiyan. To keep things brief here though, throughout this arc, Goku is warned that he is too soft-hearted to defeat Frieza. Vegeta, one of the Saiyans that attacked Earth that I mentioned earlier, is also fighting against Frieza, and repeatedly mentions this prophecy about a legendary Saiyan warrior that will rise up, a Super Saiyan. The prophecy is super vague, but one thing that consistently stands out in Vegeta's monologues about it is that the legendary Super Saiyan is supposedly completely merciless and thrives off bloodlust and cruelty in battle. At one point, Vegeta even scolds Goku, telling him that the only way he can achieve this power and beat Frieza is to throw away his mercy and harden his heart. Goku responds that he could never do that, and when he finally does face off against Frieza, he's barely keeping up with the dictator. Frieza seems completely impervious to everything Goku throws at him, until Goku's friends finally distract Frieza long enough for the Saiyan to land one giant attack that seems to finally take Frieza out. Then, just when Goku and friends think they've won and start talking about how they're going to go fishing when they get home, Frieza gets back up. And he kills Krillin, who can't be revived by the Dragon Balls anymore. And Goku loses it. 
Goku has had comrades die permanently before, but not like this. Not Krillin. This is what finally pushes him over the edge, causing him to transform into the legendary Super Saiyan. Goku's demeanor and behavior as a Super Saiyan are utterly fascinating. Gone is the happy-go-lucky fighter who, despite the stakes, always tended to enjoy the challenge of fighting strong opponents. Goku states that this form is a result of a serene heart awakened by rage, which seems to imply that this form is only achievable by a normally peaceful Saiyan finally snapping. And Goku has snapped. He even tells his other allies to leave before he loses all reason and potentially hurts them. But despite the horrible loss of his best friend, Goku isn't outwardly distraught for more than these first few moments. His attitude throughout this fight is mostly smug, taunting, and unflappable. As he fights Frieza, he's clearly toying with him, with this cocky smirk on his face, barely even fighting back at first. He mostly just effortlessly dodges all of Frieza's attacks, before letting him hit him on purpose, just to prove that it wouldn't hurt him anyways. As he does all of this, he tells Frieza that he can't win against him anymore. This is exactly how Frieza was treating Goku in the fight before his Super Saiyan transformation. So we start to wonder, maybe Goku really did need to become merciless and cruel in order to achieve this power. Maybe Vegeta was right. We're pretty sure at this point that Goku will win the fight, but who will he be when it's over? Instead of finishing off Frieza as quickly as possible, he decides to let him reach his full power, stating that he wants to completely defeat the tyrant at his best in order to properly avenge Krillin's death. He doesn't just want to beat Frieza, he wants to break him. And this is totally understandable. Frieza is a monster, one who permanently killed Goku's best friend. But at the same time, playing with Frieza like this won't bring Krillin back. It's totally just for his own self-satisfaction, and it risks more people getting hurt. It results in the planet they're on getting blown up, which could have led to more of Goku's friends or family being killed. After thoroughly trouncing Frieza, he does manage to pull himself back from the brink, opting to show him mercy by letting him live instead of finishing him off. Which is strange. Kid Goku had no remorse about killing the demon that had killed Krillin way back in Dragon Ball. It is in keeping with how Goku has treated other villains, though, and in that way it lets us know that deep down, Goku is supposedly the same pure-hearted hero he's always been, which is admittedly a great payoff to the tension built by all of Vegeta's blustering about Super Saiyans needing to be merciless and cruel. He was wrong. Goku is a Super Saiyan, and yet he's still Goku. And the lesson that Dragon Ball is trying to teach here is admirable, that you don't have to forsake kindness to get ahead that becoming a mindless violence machine isn't the path to power. Sticking true to yourself and your integrity, that's the path to self-actualization. The only problem is Goku was cruel. He was acting like Frieza. We can't just pretend like that didn't happen. I'm not saying Goku should have spared Frieza or shown him any kindness. By all means, take out the fascist. But be careful when you stare into that abyss, because after all... It stares back. In OSP's video that I mentioned earlier, Red points out that we lose access to Goku's inner monologue once he goes Super Saiyan. And thus, aside from a few utterances, we lose access to Goku's feelings aside from rage, pride, and disdain. Goku's response to losing Krillin is to close himself off, to harden his heart. And in that moment, he is rewarded for it with the power to beat Frieza. The fact that we can't admit to Goku's cruelty ends up reinforcing this idea of perfection that feeds into self-loathing. In the conflict between Anne and Andreas, Amphibia gives us a setup incredibly similar to Goku versus Frieza. However, with no foreknowledge of legendary transformations, no expectations of cruelty to subvert at the last second, this fight is able to play out in a way that truly affirms Anne's growth. After trying to fight Andreas and his robots off, Ann and company are stopped by the fact that Andreas has Sprig in his grasp. He threatens to drop him out the window of the now-flying castle if they don't stand down. They comply, and Anne tries to reason with him. Okay, dude, you have what you want. Now please, just put him down. He's my best friend. In this world, or any other world. For a second, I was convinced Anne was going to say, let him go. Guess that trope is a little played out by this point. 
The end result is the same, though, as Andreas lets Sprig plummet from the castle window. What a cruel way to twist the knife. I get the sense here that Andreas doesn't just want to stop Anne. He wants to destroy her. Like, just listen to this line. That's the thing about friends, isn't it? The more you love them, the more it hurts when they go. Allow me to demonstrate. He wants to push her to a breaking point, prove that she's no better than him. He wants to validate his own life choices by forcing Anne to make the same ones, pushing away her friends and believing in her own inherent righteousness no matter what. And Anne does reach a breaking point. After all, this is Sprig. He was the first friend she made in Amphibia, who pushed her to be better and helped show her healthy friendship for the first time in her life. And now he's going to die. Anne's transformation, for all of its similar setup to Goku's, plays out vastly differently. For one, she's not cocky or smug, she's desperate. From the fight choreography alone, we can tell that she's throwing herself and everything she has into this fight. And she's not focused on making Andreas pay. She's not giving monologues about her own superiority over the tyrant. She has one focus, one that comes through crystal clear in the only words she says while in this state. Give him back. Unlike when fighting Sasha, there's more than just rage to those words. There's also love and pain and grief. From revealing Marcy's secret to throwing Sprig out the window, Andreas has tried to push the trio into abandoning their virtues, into becoming the worst versions of themselves. Andreas mentions that the prophecy is being undone as we speak to his lord, and we actually get a glimpse of this prophecy in the book from season two, episode 10b. Three stars, burning bright, come from beyond to expel the night. Should they fight or embrace the fall, their choice will determine all. Andreas' plan succeeding depends on the girls embracing the fall, giving in to their worst impulses. So what's amazing here is that he absolutely fails at getting Anne to succumb. She doesn't close off her heart or shirk responsibility, even in response to the most painful loss she's ever been put through. In this transformation, in this fight, it's not about how cool Anne's powers are, or even about Andreas getting his just desserts. It's about us feeling the full weight of Anne's feelings, her heartbreak. This moment is tragic, painful, and yet also triumphant, because through all of this, Anne doesn't lose who she's become. Being vulnerable, being accountable to others and even the world, is no small feat. And sometimes, often even, our integrity is still not enough to stop horrific tragedies from happening. In the face of these horrors, it's tempting to become cynical, to hide behind bravado and whatever power we have, to isolate ourselves and disconnect. But keeping our hearts open, facing our actions with honesty, is what's required for self-actualization so that our true colors can shine through. Anne starts season three having finally made it back home, but with Andreas planning to invade, she has unfinished business. The concept of home is one that's been central to Anne's journey, and season 3a brings it into even greater focus. Andreas tried to convince Anne that her friends, her community, were liabilities that would only hold her back, but he was dead wrong, and with Anne back in LA and an invasion of Earth on the horizon, Strength through community becomes more important than ever. After the fight with Frieza, what did Goku do? Return home with a new sense of how easy it is to lose the people you care about? Use his newfound power to make sure that no new threat targets his home? Nope, he stays on another planet to train for almost two years. He could have come back, but he actually refuses when his friends and family try to use a wish to bring him back home. So in case it hasn't become clear by now, um, my producer Sasin has seen neither of these series. So when I was explaining this plot point to Sasin, Sasin responded, wait, so wishes are like pretty expensive, right? And I was like, yeah, they have to gather these like artifacts and they only get to use it once a year. So Sasin's like, 
So they gather these artifacts to spend this wish, which is expensive, to bring Goku back home. And he just refuses because he wants to stay somewhere else and train. And I was like, yeah, that's pretty standard Goku stuff. And Sasen was like, that's like so selfish. I need a minute to process that. And it just hit me like how accustomed to this I've gotten. And to someone who hasn't seen the series, this is not normal behavior. So I guess this little rant is us taking a minute to process just all of that. And for those who say, oh, well, he knew that he needed to get stronger to be able to protect the Earth. What good does that do when he's not around to protect it? Frieza, after somehow surviving the fight on Namek, got to Earth before him. If Vegeta and Bulma's son from the future, Trunks, hadn't been there, then everyone would have died. Goku just wanted to train more, and he left his wife and child unsupported in order to do it. When he finally does get back, he calls Chi-Chi, oh yeah, Goku has a wife named Chi-Chi? She doesn't get to do a whole lot in the story. It's a problem. He calls Chi-Chi crazy for not wanting Gohan to train to fight evil androids. Chi-Chi is portrayed super unsympathetically by the narrative, thanks misogyny, but let's look at the facts here. Gohan, her son, was kidnapped and indoctrinated into fighting at four years old. So when he says that he wants to fight, maybe Chi-Chi has some reason to be concerned about how this kind of life is affecting Gohan's judgment. Goku frames it as Gohan's education versus the future of the world. But that's ignoring the part where they could totally resolve this problem without an incredibly dangerous fight. Bulma proposed a much more reasonable solution to this problem, which not only would have kept Gohan safe, but would have avoided any battle at all. But no, all of the cis men want to test themselves against these androids, so that idea gets vetoed. People die because of this decision. No, 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 I don't care if they magically got revived because of the Dragon Balls. That's still pain and trauma that was wholly unnecessary. If Goku truly considers Earth, his family, and his friends to be his home, this is an absolutely bizarre way of showing it. This makes it seem more like Goku considers his home and his responsibilities to it burdens that keep him from achieving greater strength. When Goku returns to Earth, he comes back stronger and more confident than ever. He can even go Super Saiyan at will without any of the emotional turmoil previously associated with the form. This marks the beginning of a trend that many fans have pointed out over the years, that being a Super Saiyan increasingly becomes necessary for a character to be plot relevant. All the while, the requirements to achieve the form get, let's just say, relaxed quite a bit. But how? I thought you had to have a pure heart to become a Super Saiyan, like my dad! Oh, trust me, there's more than one way to realize the legend. I wanna! I wanna be a Super Saiyan! I wanna! I wanna! I wanna! I wanna! I wanna! I wanna! We've spent all this time with Anne trying to get back home, and now that home is going to be under attack. Her parents, her favorite foods, the family restaurant, her Thai community, the places she'd bring a friend for their birthday, the holidays she celebrates, these are what make LA Anne's home. These are the things that she risks losing. For a city that too often gets portrayed through bougie depictions of Hollywood and Beverly Hills, this is a refreshingly grounded perspective on Anne's LA. And even more than that, we get to really appreciate how both of Anne's homes, LA and Wartwood, have made her into who she is today, as well as how committed she is to them. In a brilliant role reversal, now Anne is the one taking care of the planters. She has to take responsibility for their safety now that they're the ones stranded in an unfamiliar world. It's not just protecting them from enemies either. They need help figuring out how our world works, how to not give away their identities as aliens, and how to deal with the homesickness that comes with being trapped in another world. With Anne's return to Earth, it's clear that she's not fully processing everything that happened just hours before. As Anne tries to focus on the joy of being back in L.A. with her parents and showing the planter some of the things she loves about her home on this side of the portal, she also has to deal with being attacked by a killer robot sent by Andreas. Unlike Goku, Anne can't control her newfound transformation. The first two times she uses it in Season 3A, it's in response to her family being threatened with imminent death. What's noteworthy to me is that both instances of using her powers in Season 3A occur before Anne tells her parents the full story of what happened in Amphibia, 
and result in her suffering a physical and emotional backlash. In all these instances, Anne's powers are driven by the pain and fear of losing the people she's close to. Compare this to when she's finally able to activate her powers at will in Season 3, Episode 10, Escape to Amphibia. In this episode, they've almost finished a portal back to Amphibia. But after fully opening up to her parents, relying on them, and reconnecting with them, Anne is suddenly finding it hard to leave them behind to go finish the fight. When the FBI suddenly shows up and kidnaps the planters, Anne is desperate to save them. She and her parents gather up various allies that they've made in LA over this half season, and they stage a rescue operation that ultimately ends with them getting captured by the feds as well. This causes Anne to finally buckle under the responsibility she's taken on, and express self-doubt that's probably been lurking inside her for a while. But he's right. I am just a kid. How am I supposed to save my friends, beat the FBI, defeat King Andreas, if I can't even bring myself to say goodbye to my parents? Oh hey, that kind of sounds like something someone who watched the events of Dragon Ball Z I just described would say. Bunchoi parents, how do you respond? If anyone can do this, it's you. How do you know? Are you kidding? Just look at what you already done. Survived for months in another world. Made friends and fought for people who couldn't fight for themselves. Build me that amazing Christmas float. Defeated a killer robot! Two killer robots, technically. You have grown so much. You're not my little girl anymore, Anne. You can do this. And no matter where you go or what you're doing, we'll be with you the whole way, right here. I'm pointing to your heart in case you didn't get it. I got it, Dad. All right, of course. The same way this show has responded to this detached from home and community wandering warrior archetype since day one. A swift rebuttal. After the show of support from her parents, Anne proceeds to wreck shop with the FBI. After freeing the planters, escaping the FBI, and getting to the lab to try and open the portal, Anne has one last confrontation with Mr. X, the head FBI agent who's been hunting them down. You're right, X. I am just a kid. But today reminded me that with the right people by my side, I can do anything! What the? Ah! I love that this is how Anne begins to get control over her powers. For once, she's not using them in response to something nearly killing people she cares about, or as an expression of grief and anguish. She's using them, of her own volition, as an expression of her belief in her comrades and herself. She doesn't fly off to some other planet and have a tantrum. She doesn't return to Earth having mastered the form by herself. The people that make up her home give her what her heart needs to use the power freely, without the usually apparent drawbacks. Her attachments aren't things she needs to disregard to become strong. They're what make her strong, strong enough to venture off into the final battle. This scene, where Anne looks back at her parents one last time before hopping in the portal, it's so good. Home isn't a burden. Community is our strength. To get kind of personal for a second. The concept of home and family has been complicated for me for a while. I grew up in a small town in Minnesota before moving out here to LA for school. While out here, I realized that I was trans and certain people's reactions to that led to a whirlwind of instability. I had to break off a seven-year friendship with my roommate at the time because she didn't take it very well. Eventually, her trans misogyny, ableism, and abuse made living with her impossible. I had to move out, and my housing situation was less than stable for the following year and a half. When I came out to my parents during all of this, they were and continue to be horribly trans antagonistic, and I've been no contact with them for over a year now. My brother is the only member of my family that I have any contact with at all. Combined with COVID making travel inadvisable, I haven't been back to Minnesota in years. And this winter, I was really homesick. I'd never step foot in the house I grew up in again, and who knows when I'd even see snow again, let alone my hometown. I tried to tell myself that it was fine. I was fine. I just couldn't really go home ever again. Not the way I could before. No big deal, right? But when I started watching Amphibia, I think I really started coming to terms with my feelings around the concept of home. 
I really felt for Anne as she was stuck in Amphibia trying to relay bits about her home experience to amphibians. Similarly to how I still insist that it's Duck Duck Grey Duck and not Duck Duck Goose. I sobbed when Anne talked about missing her mom at the end of Hopping Mall. The context is totally different, to be clear, but I just really resonated with that longing. I'm 28 years old, trying to somehow make something of my life, and despite everything, sometimes I just wish I had my mom. I miss my mom, and I wish I could talk to her, cook with her, be with her the way I used to. Then, after having fully caught up with season 3A, something really shifted for me. I don't think I'm supposed to say this is a transplant, but LA really feels like home now. I was able to let go of a lot of the longing for my childhood house, my hometown, and move on. Now whenever I look at the LA skyline, I hear Anne's theme in my head, and I feel this sense of contentment. Or I hear no big deal, inspiring me to rise to whatever challenges I'm facing. And the people who've been with me through all of this, they're part of my conception of home too. And these connections give me strength to be and do better and keep trying to grow into the best version of myself. Hi, this is Editing Mazine. So I originally wasn't planning on discussing anything from Amphibia Season 3B in this video because I was trying to get it out before the series ended. But lo and behold, the series finale managed to throw in one last Dragon Ball parallel that just drives this thesis all the way home. Like, seriously, I am more convinced than ever that all of this is highly intentional. And in order to understand why, we first have to briefly discuss the end of the original Dragon Ball series. Towards the end of Dragon Ball, Goku gets to meet God, who apparently lives on a floating island. Turns out that God, also known as the Guardian in the English dub, was the one who created the Dragon Balls. He remarks that he's been disappointed in how most people use the Dragon Balls to satisfy their own greed, but Goku's selfless use of them has convinced him that they should continue to exist. And in the very last chapter of Dragon Ball, God asks Goku to take his place. He asks Goku to become the next God. And Goku refuses because he says that would be too boring. So like, if you've made it this far in the video, you're probably not surprised that I don't think Goku should be God. But at the same time, his reason for refusing is incredibly immature and irresponsible. It's so disappointing that the Goku from chapter one, as well as the Goku of 2022, would probably answer this request in the exact same way. So, um... In the series finale of Amphibia, Anne sacrifices herself to save all of Amphibia from the moon crashing into it by calling on the power of all three Calamity Stones. Kind of like, I don't know, gathering all of the Dragon Balls? I mean, in order to call on their power, she even has to ask them to help her. It's, it's literally a wish. Anyways, she dies and meets God, who lives on a floating island who was the creator of the Calamity Stones. I was absolutely losing my mind when this scene was happening. God mentions that they created the stones as an experiment to test how mortals would handle unlimited power. And as it turns out, Anne was the only one who used them for good. So God asks her to take their place as guardian of the multiverse. Now, at this point, I was a bit concerned. If Anne were to accept the position, that would be agreeing with the deity's assessment that she's perfect. If she were to refuse for a similar reason to Goku's, then that would be really irresponsible and undermine her character growth. So they really had to thread this needle. And they absolutely nailed it. Anne refuses, not because it's boring, but because she acknowledges that she isn't perfect, even now, She's a 13-year-old kid who, while incredibly heroic, is still going to continue to grow and change and make mistakes. This, this, this is everything. Everyone has the capacity for change. Anne, Sasha, Marcy, Wartwood, even the frogging deity of the multiverse has room to grow. 
Anne ends the series by teaching God that there's no such thing as perfection, that there's no such thing as being perfectly pure of heart. And so this deity sends Anne back to the world of the living to live out the rest of her life. Because with another 78 years of growth, she still won't be perfect, but she'll be a better version of herself than she is today. And I think that's something we can all aspire to. To this day, there are things I still really enjoy about Dragon Ball and characteristics of Goku. I was an autistic kid who was pretty excitable, unashamed of my interests, and always kind of went all out. As an autistic adult, making an hour and 30 minute long video essay comparing media franchises I care about, clearly not too much has changed. All this is to say, I got called a tryhard a lot. Goku and a lot of the characters he influenced were comforting in that their stories told me that being dedicated, being so incredibly invested in one's interests, was something to be proud of. That pushing oneself hard wasn't cringy, but cool. That's something I'll still carry with me in life, and I'm eternally grateful for that. As I've gotten older, I've started to come to terms with how this show that's meant a lot to me has also harmed me. I can, no, I have to, hold both truths simultaneously. The misogyny and gender marginalization of the show is one part of this. But a related yet distinct aspect is how unhealthy the idea of inherent goodness propagated by the show has been. A lot of us, across all kinds of marginalization and privilege, have been in relationships with people who were hurting us, and hopefully it's clear by this point that I'm no exception. There were always reasons to conceive of those people harming me as good people deep down, that I just had to explain the problem more clearly or less emotionally and then they would get it and stop the harm. But goodness isn't a trait, it's a choice. It's a series of choices that we all have to make every day, and a lot of us benefit from the idea that we don't. Goodness as a character trait wasn't invented by Dragon Ball, but the story absolutely joins the societal choir echoing it. Ultimately, I think that's the thing that's so incredible about Anne Boon Choi, and Amphibia as a whole. Dragon Ball and countless stories like it that center cis-heteromasculinity tell us, intentionally or not, that certain values are limitations that a hero can either freely abandon or must transcend beyond in order to achieve greatness. Travel the world, go off to train, pursue the pinnacle of your abilities. The hashtag women will take care of the home that you protect. In Anne Boon Choi, Amphibia subverts these gendered ideals. Maturity, self-reflection, vulnerability, accountability, community. These are the things that make a home. These are the choices that make a hero. Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching. This idea has been in my head for months and I'm so glad to finally get to bring it to fruition. I want to do some similar shonen analysis videos for Marcy and Sasha as well, along with maybe a Music of Amphidia video, so be on the lookout for those sometime in the future. I want to thank my friend and producer Sasin for all the work that Sasin put in to helping me make this video what it is. I honestly don't think that the video would be a tenth as good as it ended up being without Sasin's interventions and frankly moral support through the multiple existential crises I had. Also, it was Sasin's request for more dancing Bibsy gifts in this outro, so you can thank Sasin for that one. I also want to thank Helena Liu for helping me with Procreate to the point where I could manage to make this video's thumbnail. Before I go, don't forget to support Hashtag New Deal for Animation and other labor movements in the animation industry. The workers that make this media that we enjoy are constantly being exploited and discarded the second it's profitable. And the only way we can fight that is with solidarity. <laughs>